Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. I couldn't help but notice this morning that during the hymn, our ranks were thinned somewhat, which lets us know that it's the, it's the middle of the week. Many of us are suffering from a Bible school hangover where you get to this point and your batteries are running low. So um, let's uh, allow God's Word this morning to invigorate us that our hearts may burn for Him, lit by His Word with heavenly flame as we've just sung together. Our class this morning, we will be dealing with the cherubim as it comes out in Ezekiel chapter 1. And I should just caution you that the cherubim in Ezekiel 1 are there with wheels. They are chariots of His will. Now in this country, as it is in Canada, when you travel in a vehicle with wheels, you are advised to fasten your seatbelt. Fasten your seatbelt. We left off yesterday, brothers and sisters, with the vision of Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. The call to action to become part of the cherubim or the seraphim, the vehicles of God's will. And today we hope to develop our understanding of these cherubim by looking at the different attributes revealed to us by Ezekiel and their associated characteristics. Our goal is going to see how God exhibited these characteristics in the past and to learn how we can exhibit them today. We don't want to get caught up in the attempt we have made to depict these things so much as we are wanting to concentrate on their meanings, the spiritual significance behind them. Remembering that the cherubim are a picture of God's manifestation in flesh and that if we want to be part of the cherubim of the kingdom, we need to demonstrate the characteristics exhibited by them in our lives now. So we begin, brothers and sisters, if you'd open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 1. This will be our home base for this morning. Ezekiel chapter 1, what Ezekiel sees is this whirlwind, verse 4, that comes out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and it has a brightness about it out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, and out of the midst there is a fire. Well, when we consider this, brothers and sisters, this, what, this is what comes out of the north. And, of course, just that little phrase itself reminds us of Daniel later on when tidings will come out of the east and out of the north. Um, but certainly, this is jumping a little bit ahead, but nonetheless, here we have this whirlwind that is coming. And, brothers and sisters, this whirlwind is coming to this world. It is going to transform this world. It is soon about to be made visible to all the nations around. Not this literal whirlwind, but what these things represent. We have here the color of amber. Now, the word color in the scripture here is given to us by Strong's as being the word ayin, which basically means the eye, the physical eye, the idea of the color of the iris, of the eye. It's also used to be the fountain, the idea of where the tears come from. But that's the word color here. It's the eye. It's out of the eye, and it's the color of amber. And amber, brothers and sisters, is one of those words that's... Um, perhaps a little bit lost its meaning in our authorized King James Version. The Septuagint translates it as electrum, which is the same way it is um, translated by some of the concordances. The idea is something along the lines of a brass, but electrum was a combined uh, metal. It was a compound made up of silver and gold. So this creature that's going to come forth out of the midst of this... this um, this whirlwind that's coming, is coming out of silver and gold. And of course, we have those characteristics, brothers and sisters, of silver and gold revealed to us in the Scriptures of Truth, gold being that of our faith tried in the fire. And we've looked at this already this week. Silver, on the other hand, is the idea of redemption, that we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. And of course, he's thinking back to the law, whether the money of the redemption, the silver money of the redemption, but we are redeemed with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But silver then becomes a metal that is associated with redemption. So this is faith and redemption. It's faith and righteousness. And just two passages to consider this. It's the compound of the two. And of course, the two do go hand in hand. We find in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 that Abraham's faith was counted to him for righteousness. 
And righteousness, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5, is by faith. The two things go side by side, and it comes out of a cloud. And the cloud, of course, represents the saints who are redeemed, who have those robes of righteousness imputed to them because of their faith. So this is the picture that we have coming out of this whirlwind. So then, brothers and sisters, when we consider this, we have Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5, out of the midst of this great whirlwind comes the likeness of four living creatures. So these living creatures, brothers and sisters, are terrible symbols in some way. Uh, they're sort of nightmarish to a degree. They're awesome. They're not sort of the kind of thing that you, you would sort of want to meet on the street, so to speak. Um, but they are symbolic, and we must remember that. They are symbolic creatures and they have physical attributes that have a spiritual significance. And that is really where we want to spend our time, is to demystify them by looking at the spiritual significance, by spending our time this morning considering what they represent. These things are discerned spiritually. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 that the secret things belong unto Yahweh our God, but those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children, that we may do all the words of this law, and that we may live forever in the land inheriting the promises. And so, brothers and sisters, we have this concept then of the cherubim in chapter 1 and verses 5 to 6 as they appear. Out of the midst thereof there came forth the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. The four, of course, becomes the number of God manifestation, the number four. The four standards of Israel, these four living creatures, their four faces, their four wings. These are living creatures, though, with the likeness of a man. And so they are a symbol of God manifest in the flesh. It's described to us that their feet were straight feet. The soles of their feet like the soles of a calf's foot. They sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had four faces. So these are a creature that has a plurality about it. It has four faces. Panim takes us back in our minds to Eden and to the law that we have been considering leading up to this class. The detail continues that their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went, every one of them, straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. They four are the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. And it says also because it would be behind. So he wouldn't be able to see it from the vantage point that he first looks at it. Now there is a little degree of graphical interpretation here as we look at these things, brothers and sisters. It says the lion is on the right side. And the question is, well, who's right? Is it the right of the cherubim or the right of the person looking at it? So what we've chosen to do is kind of follow the standards that were in the wilderness and use that as our indication. I could be wrong on that one. I'm not entirely sure. But nonetheless, um, we'll leave it for you to decide. But here we have, brothers and sisters, these creatures. And we say, well, what are they? They are, of course, as revealed to us, the heavens were opened, he says, and he saw visions of Elohim. These are visions of the mighty ones. In verse 28 of chapter 1, it's the appearance of the glory of Yahweh in his throne room, the Lord Jesus Christ with his saints around him. And, of course, they had the likeness of a man. So this is a vision of God represented in the flesh in the man. And so, brothers and sisters, let's take a look then at the different aspects of these creatures and see if we can draw some lessons from them for ourselves. The first of them we'd like to consider is that of the wings. Every one of them had four faces and every one had four wings. We have considered the faces in our last class when we looked at the standards of the children of Israel as they went through the wilderness. So we'd like now to consider the wings that are added to this. The definition of the wings is the word kanaf, 
which basically means the uh, border, the edge, or the skirt. It is different from the skirt or the train that filled the temple in Isaiah chapter 6, but the idea is somewhat similar. Gesenius defines it as to cover, to cover over, or a wing because it covers, because a bird, of course, is covered by its wings quite often. That reminds us, does it not, brothers and sisters, of the law. It reminds us of the cherubim whose wings overshadowed the mercy seat. Remember, the ark was typical. It was pointing forward to something in the future. And the antitype, the actual thing it's pointed forward to, is now being represented by these cherubim. One of the details about the wings is that they are joined together. These wings are joined together, and um, they're joined one to another. And they turn not what they went, they won every one of them straight forward. Now, when you look at these features, the arcs, the wings of the cherubim touched the ark, they joined one to another um, across the ark. Uh, Solomon's temple, the two cherubim that we didn't have time to look at, that stood over top of the ark, each of them 10 cubits, making the 20 cubits. One wing outside touched the, the wall, the other one touched the cherub on the other side, and then it would, the, the second cherub again, would touch the one in the middle and then over to the wall as well. So the ark was underneath the two of them. Um, that may be how this is uh, to be understood here. I, I can't say that I'm entirely sure about that one. Um, but one of the things we should know is it does say that they uh, thrust their faces, verse 11, their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one of them joined one to another and two covered their bodies. So if two of the wings are stretched upward, it's going to be difficult for them to be touching each other on the sides. And it says that they are joined one to another. So that's sort of where we've taken the idea of representing them as their wings pointing upward and they are joined one to another. Each creature itself, of course, being a manifestation of a multitude. But the idea of wings touching one another is the idea of fellowship, of connecting together one with the other. But we'd like to consider, brothers and sisters, this idea of the wing and how it is used throughout the scriptures. We think of Yahweh's wings, as we have already looked at in uh, Psalm 18 and Psalm 104. It's the wings of the cherub, and he flies upon the wings of the wind. So it's, it's a method of transportation, and we looked at that the other day. And it's how God transported Israel to himself out of Egypt. He says in Exodus 19, verse 4, Ye have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, brothers and sisters, this eagle here, this is actually the griffin vulture. Um, this is the bird, according to uh, the Jews, that is being talked about. It's the eagle of the Middle East. It's a fairly large bird, seeing that its wingspan is 8 to 10 feet. So it's, it's a rather big bird if you had this sort of land on your bird feeder in the backyard you might be a little concerned but he says that he bare them on eagles wings now it's interesting because this idea of being born on eagles wings um, an ornithologist I think I got that right which is a bird watcher I'm assuming why can we can't just call people bird watchers I don't know but anyway in recent years it says that certain reliable observers have actually seen a parent bird let its young rest for a moment on the feathered back especially when there's no place um, or roost in sight so the the eagle of the Middle East it's a rare thing it's not seen over here but as the young are learning to fly, it, it sort of, as most birds do, pushes them out the nest, and they flutter and flap, and, and when they fail, the eagle swoops down underneath and bears up the young, and then it lets them go again, and they try it again. And we see that picture of God who bears us up, and he lifts us up, and he carries us when we're in our weakness until we can fly again and they're born upon the wings of the wind. And so this is the idea that is revealed to us here. It's also the idea of protection, the eagle stirring up her nest and fluttering over her young, spreading her wings over them. She bears them on her wings. So it's the idea of the, the eagle that, that flutters over them, that covers them. 
It's very interesting, brothers and sisters, that this is the same word used by Ruth in Ruth chapter 3, verse 9. It's a passage that perhaps sometimes has been a little bit confusing for us and a little bit difficult to explain. She says uh, to Boaz, who is on the, the uh, threshing floor, and he's sleeping, and she goes to, the, to his feet, and she asks him to spread, therefore, thy skirt, which is thy wings, over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And sometimes we read that and we think, well, what exactly does that mean? And the meaning becomes clear when we look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, when God says of himself and Israel, Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee, and behold, thy time was time of love. And I spread my skirt on my wings over thee, and I covered thy nakedness. Yea, yea I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord Yahweh, and thou becamest mine. So the idea of the wings is the idea of the covering, the protection of Yahweh, and the entering in of covenant. It's the wings of the truth of Psalm 91 verse 4, where he says, He shall cover thee under his feathers, and thou shalt trust in, or, uh, and thou shalt trust, his truth shall be thy shield. It is what is protecting us, what covers us, the, the truth. It's also interesting, brothers and sisters, in Zechariah, in the future age, when the Jews once again become the vehicle of his will, ten men shall take hold of the skirt of the wings of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So the idea of the wings is tied in with the idea of the truth and of covenant relationship and of bringing people into covenant relationship and of spreading the truth. But, brothers and sisters, this is a study in God manifestation. How do we manifest the character displayed by these wings? Well, James tells us, brothers and sisters, in James chapter 1 and verse 27, that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Ruth was both fatherless and a widow. She had left her father and mother, and she was a widow, and Boaz spread his skirt over her. He spread his wings over her. So for us to manifest the character of the wings is for us to spread our skirts over the fatherless and the widows, those of the ecclesia who need the help of the, or the hand of Yahweh upon them. Philippians chapter 2 puts it in slightly a different way. It's the other aspect of this idea of wings, the idea of bringing the truth. We're told that we should be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. So it's the delivery of the truth to those around. And of course, the wings, brothers and sisters, are something that is borne up by the ruach by the Spirit. They fly upon the Word, really, is the idea. So our transportation, our method of travel, is that of being born by the Word. However, as we looked at yesterday, if we do not choose to have this characteristic, there is another characteristic of the wing. The Lord Jesus Christ said to Israel, How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you wouldn't have it. If we are not gathered under the wings of Yahweh, if we are not in covenant relationship with Him and remain that way to walk in the truth, then the reverse is true that wheresoever the eagles be gathered together, or whether it's so are the carcasses, the eagles will be gathered together. And as Deuteronomy says, He would send a nation on them from far uh, as the eagle flieth. We looked at the other day how it's a symbol as well of renewed strength. Isaiah 40, verse 31, they shall mount up as wings with wings as the eagles. But it's also the idea, brothers and sisters, of bringing that healing, the son of righteousness who arise with healing in his wings, bringing the truth to those around us to heal their lives, and having the Lord Jesus Christ heal our lives with the application of the word. And notice in this verse, there's two Karabic features. There is the wings... And there is also the calves of the stall. 
The wings have a certain noise to them. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 24, he says, They went, and I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. So this is a multitudinous image, because it's not just the noise of one, it's the noise of a host. It's the voice of the Almighty. And so that has to be our voice, brothers and sisters. As Brother Roger talked about yesterday in the uh, brothers class, it doesn't matter what you feel or what I feel, but what saith the Lord to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to these things, it's because there's no light in them. Our noise should be the noise, our voice should be the voice of Almighty God speaking His truth. It's also described over the page in chapter 3 as the voice of a great rushing. I heard the noise of the wings. It's a voice of rushing. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But consider, brothers and sisters, that this is the same characteristic that is there in the book of Revelation. When we read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, that his voice was as the sound of many waters. And this comes up in chapter 14 and chapter 19 as well. It's the multitudinous voice, but it's a united voice. It's united, and as we looked at with the seraphim, seeing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, Yahweh of armies, the King of Israel. The rushing, though. On the day of Pentecost, when the disciples were gathered together as one man, with one accord, as the margin re reads there, as one man, in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a great rushing mighty wind. And what happens is, of course, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them. And when they speak, what do they speak? As the Spirit gave them utterance. And so, brothers and sisters, the cherubim, the noise of the cherubim, is the noise of those who speak the Word of God in truth. Holy men of God who speak as they are moved by the Holy Spirit as they are rushed by the Holy Spirit, penned this word. And we too can pour forth that word to those around us. And so, brothers and sisters, we have briefly the lesson of the cherubim. The cherubim have the divine characteristics of wings signifying both protection and judgment. They are born of the Spirit. They are carried by the Ruach. They are lifted up by the word of God. They have been covered under Yahweh's wings, in which they have come to trust. And likewise, they cover others with Yahweh's wings. They are joined in fellowship, and they're now involved in covering others with the truth. We have to join our voices with this multitude as the voice of God. Our words must be God's words coming out of our mouths and not our own, but going out to the ends of the earth. We must speak the word of God as the voice of God to those at school, at work, and in our neighborhoods. And if we want to be part of the, the cherubim, brothers and sisters, we must be ex exhaling the spirit that God inspired into these words to all those around us. And we certainly should bring our children under Yahweh's wings by doing the readings on a daily basis by speaking to them in the way. When we rise up and when we go to bed at night, we have to bring our children under these wings. The cherubim also, though, have these peculiar straight feet. They are feet that are straight feet, the soles of their feet, like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkle with the color of burnished brass. And so we have this idea of being straight. It's the word yasher. And it means basically upright, just, righteous. So their walk is upright and just and righteous. It's like David in 1st of Kings chapter 15 and verse 5. He did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh. He did that which was yasher, that which was upright. Well, we're jumping ahead here. Just a minute. Oh, we'll leave that one there. Um, and of course, the uh, words of Psalm 107 verse 5, he led them forth by the right way, the yasher, the upright way. 
And so these straight feet, brothers and sisters, are the ones we have to have. Our walk has to be upright. Who is wise, says Hosea, chapter 14, verse 9, and he shall understand these things, prudent, he shall not know them, or he shall know them, for the ways of Yahweh are right, and the just shall walk in them, but transgressors shall fall therein. So we have straight feet, the idea of walking in uprightness. But these feet, of course, brothers and sisters, are feet of brass. And we've looked at the idea of brass already. It's the concept, of course, of flesh. We think of Moses, they had the serpent of brass, and um, it's upon a pole, so it represents flesh, but it's not just brass. It's brass that has been burnished. It is flesh that has been subjected to affliction. It has been tried in the fire. And we know, brothers and sisters, in uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, it will be through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. May I put it to you that if you're not feeling burnished, you're probably not reading enough of the Word. You're probably not being challenged enough to look at your life and to say, what is it that I am doing that is correct or incorrect? And what we have to do is apply that fire to our lives, as our brother Jay was talking about last night, the furnace, to purge out the dross and to find out if there's any wicked way in us, as it says in the, I believe it's the 123rd Psalm, and ask God to find that out and direct us in the right way. So the lesson of the feet, brothers and sisters, these are feet which are, or the cherubim first of all, to remind us, are God manifest in the flesh. We are to walk uprightly in righteousness, departing not to the right hand or to the left. Our feet are to bring the gospel of peace, a verse we didn't have time to look at, but Romans chapter 10 and verse 15, and it is flesh subject to affliction. That is what is depicted here. He goes on to say, Now I beheld the living creatures, and behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. And he goes on later to describe that there are actually four wheels. And so we, we recognize, brothers and sisters, that this, pa this passage is a bit peculiar, but we have to think of it in terms of the definition. Cherubim are chariots, so why should there not be wheels? And of course, this picture has been seen elsewhere. Daniel chapter 7, when we looked at verses 9 to 10, the one that was on the throne, the Ancient of Days, the throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So this picture is not one that's just isolated to Ezekiel, but it's found elsewhere as well. A little peculiar, I'll give you that, but let's take a look at it and see what we can find out. What do the scriptures reveal? Well, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of beryl. They four had one likeness in their appearance, and their work was as it was a wheel in the midst of a wheel. How exactly that works, I confess I don't know. It has been depicted like this above, where it's two wheels intersecting each other. And that, the word in the Hebrew maybe has a little bit of that kind of concept. But it also could be a little bit more gyroscopic in nature, where you have an outside wheel that turns and a smaller inside wheel that can turn in a different direction. Um, that is possible, I suppose, from this as well. How exactly it is, I can't say that I could give you that answer. But what we do know about them, brothers and sisters, is that they are full of eyes, round about and within, and the wheels also. Now, we're going to come to that little detail tomorrow. It's very peculiar, but it does come up in multiple places, and we'll spend some time on that tomorrow. They are, however, brothers and sisters, they are wheels of beryl. Now, beryl is the word Tarshish, interestingly enough, in the uh, Strong's Concordance, which gives you its origin. It came from Tarshish, is along the idea. It's one of those minerals or one of those gems that was mined from wherever this Tarshish place was. Now, it tells you that it's a chrysolite, this is Strong's, a yellow jasper, jasper being green, this being a yellow green. It's probably a little bit more yellow than we've depicted in the greenness here, but uh, we just wanted to kind of make it stand out a little bit more, otherwise if it was yellow, it might just disappear. But nonetheless, it's the idea of a new shoot. 
If you think of a little blade of grass as it first comes up, it has that yellowish greenish color, that's this color. It's the color of the newness of life. The springing forth at the very beginning of the spring of those little shoots. That's the color of beryl. It's the color of the gem that was on the fourth row, um, or sorry, the fourth stone, I think it is, uh, first stone on the fourth row of the breastplate. And it's also a precious stone, we're told, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. It is a color that's used of the saints throughout. It's depicted of the beloved who comes in Song of Solomon chapter 5 and verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's depicted in the man of one in Daniel chapter 10 verses 5 to 6. His body is that of Beryl. We don't have time to look at that, but just notice that his feet also are feet that are in color uh, polished brass. It's burnished brass and his voice is the voice of a multitude. Different picture, but it's the same thing. It's the multitudinous Christ. Anyway, as we continue on looking at this idea of the beryl, it is a precious stone, says Ezekiel chapter 28 and at verse 13. Hmm. Turn in your Bible, please, to Malachi chapter 3 and at verse 16. The precious stone. They that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh, that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith Yahweh of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. It's the same word, precious stones. And I will spare them as a man spareth his son that serveth him. And our reading, ironically, last night was from Revelation chapter 22, where we see this great uh, symbolic picture of New Jerusalem coming out of heaven. And what's it made of? Well, the foundation in chapter 18, or 21, verse 18 to 21, the eighth foundation stone is the beryl. So these are jewels that God uses to make up his crown. They are what make up the New Jerusalem the temple that the Lord would build for his father, the symbolic one this time, the spiritual one. Of course, that's not a literal picture in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 either. It's also the same word used, brothers and sisters, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye will indeed obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You will be a special jewel. You will be a precious stone. It's the same idea. So God says to Israel, if you obey my covenants, then you will be a precious jewel. And of course, brothers and sisters, we know that's not just said to Israel, but to those also who are adopted into this nation through the covenant. First of Peter chapter 2 and verse 19, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a special treasure, a peculiar people. It's the word special treasure. That you should show forth the praises or the characteristics of him who has called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. So the idea of the barrel, brothers and sisters, is one of a special treasure that God is willing to take and put into his crown that will make up the new Jerusalem, that will be part of that special treasure that he's called out of all nations. But the reason it is special is because it reflects the deity. It shows back to God the character that he has revealed through his word. They are God manifest in the flesh. If we want to be part of this cherubim, then we must be reflections of that same deity. It's beryl, though, brothers and sisters. It's green. It's that idea of the new little shoot. And so we read in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24 that we are to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. 
It's the idea of the new man being renewed in knowledge, being created after God in righteousness and true holiness. That's the color of beryl. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should move, we should walk, we should be in motion. What kind of motion, brothers and sisters? The motion of the newness of life. These wheels are the color of the newness of life, which is the way we have to walk now. That is who we must become. They are, of course, directed by the Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verses 19 down to 21, these creatures move, the wheels went by them, it says. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up against them. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The Spirit, the driving force, is in these wheels. They are the multitudinous Christ who is moving in newness of life. Life in the truth, brothers and sisters, is not a destination. It's a journey. We don't get baptized and stop. The cherubim were moving creatures. It's walking in the newness of life. If at any point in time we stop, we begin to go back, back to the world. There is no stopping in the truth. We read, brothers and sisters, that these are directed by the Spirit of God. And of course, it's the Spirit Word. We think of this concept, the Spirit of the truth that is there to guide us. We need to have our Bibles open so that we can hear the words of the Spirit. Those who make up the cherubim are the sons of God for a reason. We're told in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We must be in motion being led by the Spirit of God, not by our own spirit. Forget our ways and our paths and our thoughts. Forsake them and turn to our God. And let Him direct us, brothers and sisters. That's who these creatures are. They are directed by the Spirit. They went, it says, but the place whither the head looked, they followed. They turned not as they went. They follow the head. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, If any man will come unto me, let him take up his cross and follow me. Chapter 19, verse 27, the Apostle Peter says, Lord, we have forsaken all and followed thee. Begs the question, have we, brothers and sisters, forsaken all and followed him? Have we chosen to be directed by the head that wherever our Lord would look, wherever our Lord would go, that's where we would go. And wherever he wouldn't go, we would not be found there. Perhaps sometimes that's more the challenge, isn't it? But we do, certainly, brothers and sisters, need to be directed by the Spirit, by the Word of God. Not the Holy Spirit, like the, word looks at it, the world around us looks at it, that some message from God shoots onto the screen and tells us what to do. Digression. I looked at my time. Um, we had a, a lady work, uh, I ran a training school for a very short period of time, and um, one of the women that was in this training school actually came out to our seminars for a while, which was incidental to being at the training school. And um, she was one of these people who had the Holy Spirit. And it was a very difficult thing um, with the ecclesia. One of our brethren spent a lot of time trying to talk to her. And we had... Um, in the, uh, the training school, different courses you could take, and she kept on wanting to change courses. And every time I was I said, well, why do you want to change from this course to that course? Well, I've had a message from the Spirit, and so I'm going this direction. And, and um, one of the people at work was a pastor's wife. So I thought, well, I'm going to try this one on for size. So I asked him, I said, um, Alan, I said, do you ever get in your con congregations people who think they have a red phone to the big guy? You know, are there people there who think they're directly connected? 
And he says, yes, we do. He says, and they're usually the ones that whenever there's trouble, they get a phone call and they're gone. They just change direction. And so this is what was happening, but it's not that kind of an idea, brothers and sisters. We don't get messages from God to go to this and go to that. It's the word that drives us. It's the word that directs us. It's the word that motivates us. We are led by the spirit of truth. So these creatures, brothers and sisters, they have wheels. It's interesting because these wheels, there's two words. It's often is what the word basically is. Um, it's the Hebrew word and it means to revolve. It's the wheel of a chariot. Now, very interestingly, the man Eliezer ben Yehuda, who revived the Hebrew language, and if you're looking for a good book to read, I would highly recommend The Tongue of the Prophets, which is the story of his life. It is a fulfillment of prophecy, because when Israel goes back to the land, they are called Israel. It's a Hebrew word. When we come to the book of Revelation and the great battle is to take place, it is at Armageddon, which is in the Hebrew tongue. And that language for years was a dead language, and this man revived it. Well, when he had to come up with a word for bicycle, he did it, but he revived it by going through all the writings of the ancient Hebrews, right? Well, there are no bicycles in the Bible, so he had to come up with a word for bicycle. So he took this word out of Ezekiel, often, and said, well, if there's two of them, we'll add an I-M, which is the plural, so it's oftenim. So that is the Hebrew word for bicycle used today. So this is the idea, the revolving wheels, the, that which is ridden. The second word is the idea of rolling. It is the word Gilgal, or Galgal, as it is here, a rolling thing, a wheel or a whirling. And so we find, brothers and sisters, if you'll just turn over to Ezekiel chapter 10, because here we have a bit of a more of a description of these wheels. Ezekiel 10, by the way, is a narrative we're going to look at tomorrow. It fits into a bigger story, and we're going to look at that story tomorrow. But some of the extra details are added in there when we're looking at these cherubim. And in chapter 10 and verse 13, it is said to the wheels, to the ophan, it is cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel, which is Gilgal, which is whirl or roll. So it's said to the ophan, Gilgal. It said to the wheel, roll. And so, brothers and sisters, that is what we have to do. We have to roll. Of course, Gilgal is used, as you know, the place that we looked at just the other day. It is where they retreated back over the river. Um, yesterday, I believe it was in the readings, it was Gilgal. It was the place of the rolling away of the reproach of Egypt. So these wheels are those who have rolled away the reproach. But they haven't just rolled away the reproach. Psalm 37 verse 5 says they have committed their way. They have rolled themselves toward, is what the word means, Yahweh. So it's not just cutting off the flesh, touch not, taste not, handle not. It's not just the negative things. It's the positive as well. In fact, it is the way we overcome the flesh. Does not Paul say, mortify the flesh through the Spirit? by actively engaging in the work of the truth, we put to death the flesh. If we run around trying to just cut off all the flesh, we'll end up being amputees. We won't last very long. We must engage ourselves in the work of the truth and displace it, push the flesh out of our lives. And of course, we can never perfectly do this. So, brothers and sisters, we have then this idea of the spirit that quickens the flesh, profits nothing. The words the Lord Jesus Christ spoke unto us are spirit and life. And so we have to be energized by these words. The spirit was in the wheels. The word energizes, it quickens, it makes alive. They are motivated, they are energized, their power source is the Word of God. This is what makes them move. And they're constantly in motion. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 14 says, the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. And so we have the lesson of the wheels then. The wheels are the color of beryl, the color of a new shoot of a plant signifying new growth, signifying they are to walk in newness of life as the new man. 
They are precious jewels because they fear Yahweh and thought often upon His name. They become a special treasure or a peculiar people who are to show forth the praises or the virtues or the characteristics of Yahweh. They are directed by the Spirit of Yahweh and consequently are the sons of God. They are commanded to whirl, signifying they are to be constantly employed in the work of God. They are to roll with Yahweh, meaning they trusted with Him or on Him, and consequently they are to roll their ways and their works unto their God. If you had told me, brothers and sisters, at the beginning of the study, that a study in the cherubim is a study in discipleship, I wouldn't have believed you, but it is. That is what we're dealing with here, is a study in discipleship. The cherubim are a representation of perfect discipleship. They are God manifest in the flesh. They are with the Lord Jesus Christ depicted in the book of Revelation. They are there depicted, brothers and sisters, in Daniel chapter 7. And if we want to be with the Lord at that point in time, we must become cherubim, vehicles of His will.